most of the things that she's done in the novel happen. At some point, she talks about how a normal organization would never hire her. You know, she couldn't work for a normal organization. And that is true. The CIA is not a normal organization. Things that would get you run out of any normal corporate are not necessarily fireable offenses inside CIA. Welcome to Spymasters Podcast. This is our inaugural outing and I'm so delighted to have you with us. Our first guest is the incredible David McCloskey. David is a former CIA analyst and best-selling novelist. His first book, Damascus Station, was a Times Thriller of the Year and was loved by readers and critics alike for combining a realistic version of modern espionage with a cracking story. His new book, Moscow X, is just out in the UK. I've read it, it's incredible, and I'm delighted that David is our first guest. We'll be talking about modern spycraft and the challenges of storytelling. We've got some brilliant guests lined up, including top intelligence historian Helen Fry and former director of the CIA, General David Petraeus. So follow us, tell your friends, spread the word. We're a podcast about secret and lies, but don't keep shit about us. So back to me with David McCloskey. David, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you. So I would love the listeners to hear a little bit more about Moscow X, which I completely devoured over Christmas. It's really compelling. Can you tell us just a little bit about the premise and what's going on in the novel? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me here, Antonia. It's just a, it's wonderful. And I'm thrilled to be talking with you today. Um, Moscow X uh, is a story, and there's a lot of twists and turns with how this thing came about, but essentially it became a story about what it might look like if the CIA got very serious about sticking it to Vladimir Putin and the Russians. And the book, Moscow X, the title, comes from a fictional component of the CIA's very real Russia house, which in the novel is run by this wonderfully colorful and deranged, I think, CIA case officer named Artemis Proctor, who has been charged with taking a very outside-the-box aggressive approach to dealing with the Russians. And the, the plot that she concocts in the novel is to make Putin believe that a coup is underway when one is, in fact, not. And so to do that, she turns to a couple CIA case officers who are under a somewhat exotic form of cover. We call them NOCs, N-O-Cs. They are case officers who are under, not under diplomatic cover, as you might normally conceive of it. They don't work out of embassies. One of them is actually based in London. She is a uh, a lawyer uh, whose firm specializes in hiding the assets and wealth of the super rich. And then the other one, his name is Max, uh, is actually a, a, a horse breeder and dealer whose family ranch is in northern Mexico. And these two officers get in front of a Putin money man, this fairly despicable character named Vadim who uh, lives in St. Petersburg and is a banker and, you know, sort of shields and, and protects a, a bunch of Putin's wealth. Vadim's wife, Anna, is essentially a Russian version of our Knox. She, is a, she works for the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, the SVR, uh, and she is a banker and also an intelligence officer. And so what kind of unfolds here is a game of cat and mouse between Moscow X and between the Russians, particularly Anna, who is really playing a game all her own. So it's a story, of course, you know, hopefully about modern espionage and what that actually looks like and feels like and smells like. But also, you know, I hope a story about all the good things that spy novels, uh, you know, all the good themes that spy novels draw in, so betrayal and loyalty and vengeance, kind of a set in the middle of the shadow war between Washington and Moscow. Let's talk a little bit about how you came to write spy novels before we go in to unpick the kind of Russian themes that you bring up there. Talk to us a little bit about how you get into the CIA in the first place, because that in itself is fascinating, and then how you go on from that to your current incarnation. I got into the CIA in a way that I'm sure would make many of the uh, 
OSS kind of skull and bones forebears twist over in their graves because I got in by just being recruited on a Midwestern liberal arts campus outside of Chicago when I was a freshman uh, in college. Uh, the CIA showed up on campus. They were recruiting openly. Uh, at the time, my resume had me with a bit of time working at the Wendy's fast food chain and also digging holes for a sprinkler system company. And so I thought, this seems like it could be a reasonable step up, uh, you know, if they'll have me. And of course, I had no thought that I would ever get in, but it sounded fascinating to me as a young person who was studying international relations in the world and wanted to travel and understand how the world worked. And so I put my name in, applied, and somehow got through the process. So I did a couple summers actually as an intern, and then I joined full time after I graduated, worked on Syria and the Middle East pretty much the whole time. and. That experience, because, you know, by the time I had left, Syria was in the middle of its civil war. And I was deeply affected by that. Uh, you know, the, the, the devastation, the shattering of that country, I think, is, is, is almost impossible for us sitting, you know, in, in London or here in Texas to, to understand. Fully half of the population was either displaced or uh, fled the country. The poverty rate in, in Syria is somewhere between 80 and 90 percent, depending on how you count it. And it's effectively been cantonized, you know, into little statelets, fiefdoms. It's it's a it's a warlord economy and, and society that has been just deeply destroyed. And for me, watching that, having lived there, having worked on the country for so long, it was a deeply affecting and moving experience. And so when I left the agency, one of the things I sat down I had no intention of ever writing a spy novel, but I sat down and just started to write about that experience. And there were snippets and vignettes and characters, some of whom were real in those kind of initial writings, and, and some of which was not, was just kind of an effort yeah. to work through stuff. And I wrote for a summer, almost full time before I started a new job, and found in the writing that I, I I would quickly get into flow. You know, I, I would sit down and it was like, where did six hours go? Where did eight hours go? And so even though what I had at that point was legitimately terrible from the standpoint of story, plot, characterization, the writing, I mean, I have no formal background in how you actually write, but I just knew that I loved to write. Um, and so I, I put that whole thing aside did another job for five years, came back to it eventually and thought, well, how do I get back to that experience of writing? And how do I tell a story about the CIA in Syria that's authentic? And so Damascus Station, my first novel, came out really, you know, the product of that. And, and so the, the process of writing espionage fiction for me was, it was not ever this moment where I sat down and said, I'm going to be a, a you know a writer who does spy fiction it was just kind of this organic process of trying to get that story out and tell it authentically and one thing you know led to another and um you know here i am with with a couple novels written and and the third one pretty much done so you know it it it, it it's kind of been a i take the next step i take the next step kind of process that's a really interesting way of looking at it, because I guess you kind of get into this subsection of fiction and then you can take a quite complicated, difficult subject and kind of retell it within the construct of a storytelling process, you know, and give it a beginning, a middle and an end. Do you think there's a kind of joy in the genre that you get to do that? Yeah, no, I think that is definitely true. Story isn't life. Story is a metaphor for life in my opinion. And so it has to be real to the actual themes of the world and life. And, and in a spy novel, that means that if you tell a spy story that's got some kind of sugary ending to it, overdone, it's not going to ring true. But at the same time, because it's a metaphor for the world of espionage or stories inside that world, you, you do have the freedom to play around with an actual arc that doesn't actually connect to the way that 
life actually functions. You know, I mean, a, a lot of the analysis operations, what it's actually like to work in intelligence, you know, there's no neat uh, ending, right, to a lot of these stories. Um, they don't, they they wouldn't, maybe if you told them 100% accurately, make the best spy novels, if for no other reason than a lot of the intelligence work is actually just people sitting in front of computers writing, you know, um, which which does not lend itself to the kind of storytelling that that many readers want to read. But at the same time, I think that playing around with that idea of kind of a an arc of character or plot inside the real world of espionage does allow you as a writer to bring out themes that might not, and, and frankly, to to help educate people uh, about the way intelligence agencies function, about what espionage actually is, you know, hopefully in a, in a way that makes it accessible to a broad group of people that may never pick up a nonfiction book about CIA or MI6 or the, the KGB or whatever, but who, through the world of, uh, you know, spy novel are sort of introduced to to reality, right, through the lens of story. So I think, and frankly, just as a writer, being able to bend reality for the purposes of storytelling is fun. You know, um, it's fun. In, in, in my first novel, Damascus Station, it was fun to play around with what if the whole red line thing had turned out differently. It was fun to put a bomb in the room next to Bashar al-Assad because I think he kind of deserved it. I didn't know. I don't kill him in the book. So <laughs> fun to play around with that stuff. And it, in Moscow, X, you know, I think I do some similar stuff with, with Putin. So that's, that's fun. And, and it, 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 it feels less constrained, obviously, than the world of having to report what really happened. So your expertise is in the Middle East. That's where you worked um, as an analyst for the CIA. But you've moved in this new book towards Putin's Russia. What prompted that move? Well, I would like to say that I was just trying to get ahead of the headlines, but that would be completely false. I mean, the the way it actually happened was I thought I thought I wanted to tell a story because I, 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 I debated you know, do I do a do I do a follow up to Damascus Station or something like that set in Syria or set in the Middle East? And I think there was a part of me that said, okay, I want a challenge. I want to try something new. So I'm not going to do that, at least not now. So what do I do next? And uh, this was, you know, sort of mid, this was COVID times and the world was still relatively locked down. And the idea of being able to travel anywhere for research or anything like that felt hard. And so I thought, okay, I'll tell a story that's set in Texas exclusively. It's a spy story. It'll be set in Texas, and it'll have Russians involved. Um, and I had, you know, for a while, I had a Russian defector who was in Dallas, and I had a um, a Russian wet work team that w were masquerading as uh, Terminex, ex you know, bug exterminators. And we had this chase all through Texas down to the uh, the border with Mexico in the Big Bend region. And I wrote about, <clears throat> I'd say about. 50,000 words or so of that story and sent it to my editor who kindly read them. And in a few days gave me a call and said, he thought it was terrible and that this was not a story <laughs> that I should write and I should immediately abandon it more or less. And, uh, and so I, you know, this is, this is a sort of a dark period for a, a you know relatively new writer who's just been told that what you've been working on for months sucks uh, in, in no uncertain terms. And so I, uh, I threw it away dutifully though, and, uh, was thinking about how, what do I do next? And I had a couple characters in that story who were Russian and who I thought worked as characters. Like they were, I, I, there was something there. And so I made maybe the terrible mistake then of moving them into Russia and redoing the story, but Literally, the reason why the whole thing is set in Russia is because I tried to write a Texas story that didn't work. I had Russians that I felt did work. And so I moved them. And then I thought, oh, crap, now I've got to learn a lot more about Russia because I've got this thing set in St. Petersburg and Moscow and kind of in the heart of Russian power. So what do I do? And so honestly, you know, I like to learn, which is helpful. And so I, the, the challenge, you know, sort of challenge accepted. Let me figure out how I could render this. But I, 
did it every step of the way with a sort of extreme trepidation knowing that you know i could i could render at least my image of damascus without really doing much additional research this one every step of the way i had to think about how am i you know what are people wearing what does it smell like what does the food taste like where do people live you know that kind of like all that stuff i had to build it from the ground up so it was very uh it was very painful uh i'm happy with how it turned out but it was a it was a deeply painful process i mean it doesn't read painfully (laughs) okay well that's good that's good At the centre of the story is Artemis Proctor, who is an extraordinary character. She's brilliant. For listeners unfamiliar with Artemis Proctor, can you tell us a little bit more about her? Yes, uh, she's my favourite character, and and she connects the first novel, Damascus Station, to Moscow X, although they're they're standalone stories, uh, in in my opinion. Um, Artemis Proctor is... Uh, and her middle name is Aphro- Aphrodite, so Artemis Aphrodite Proctor. She's a she's a sort of um, highly uh, competent, extremely tough CIA case officer uh, who had been chief of station in Damascus, and now she's running Moscow X. She is kind of I, I, there's a, a female case officer that I worked with who I took some inspiration from to create the Artemis Proctor character, and I could never say who it is, and and. I hope that she doesn't figure it out because I probably wouldn't be long for this world. She would find me and eliminate me. So I have, I, I will never say who that is, but there's, I started with kind of some pieces of her character and then quickly found that Proctor had a life of her own. And, and she is one of those characters where um, she's very physical. She has a, a, a potty mouth uh, to say the least. And she's very direct and blunt, but she's she's also very good at her job. And she has, I think, become kind of a version of here's the CIA officer that we kind of all hope exists somewhere. You know, this person who just gets stuff done and kind of doesn't care, but sort of does about the bureaucracy and, and it treats her people really roughly, but also cares deeply about them, you know, Um and she is kind of the, 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 she does things that all the CIA case officers who I spend time with and talk to kind of wish they had done when they were on the inside. <laughs> and so she, she rolls all those things up together. You know, everyone wishes that they had somehow figured out how to make Putin believe that he was, you know, going to be overthrown and, and, you know, initiates a night of the long knives in Moscow. You know, that, that's what people want to do. Like, and so she, she's the one doing that. And she is one of those characters where you start a scene thinking, we're going to we're going to go this direction and then she takes it another um which is how you know it, at least for me like how i know when i'm writing a character that i'm working with something interesting is cuz her voice is so strong that she could actually appear and redirect stories and scenes and make them even more interesting so the first you know the first chapter of moscow x is a fairly colorful intro to her and i had when i started that scene which involves without spoiling anything you know it involves vodka it involves some photographs that were taken clandestinely of her and used as blackmail and involves a bottle of horse milk that smashed over a russian intelligence officer's head at one point um i started that scene with no idea what was going to happen and that's what proctor made happen so you know she's a she's an agent of chaos and i i love her for it Reading through the book again, when I knew I was going to be talking to you, I was trying to pick out some of my favourite lines about her, and there were just too many. But one of them I stumbled across was where you said Proctor had been told in several gobbledygook upward feedback reports that she possessed the leadership instincts of a tiger centipede. I love that. Yeah, I have. I I have. uh, Every time she's on the page is a great opportunity for lines lines like that. and and she's just she's immense she's immense fun to write i don't know where she came from precisely because she's grown beyond sort of the the initial image i had of her based on my former colleague the the sort of crazy case officer uh and become her own animal but she's she's wonderful then 
the way she begins to operate it kind of blends what we think of as traditional spy craft and the kind of more modern stuff so on the one hand there's quite a lot in the book about kind of bitcoin and financial markets and you know digital covert ops and on the other hand the heart of the story is about human intelligence it's about agents on the ground in peril and what I wondered was how much was that decision making of kind of blending those two forms of tradecraft? How much was that decision making about how modern espionage works? And how much of that was about the demands of storytelling? Because obviously, as you said initially, when we started talking this morning, a book about a bunch of guys sitting around at their computers writing code would not be much fun. So how much is storytelling and how much of that is real? Yeah, so you you were hitting on, I think, one of the one of the primary tensions in a lot of modern spy fiction which is how do you how do you write stories that necessarily have to i think to be compelling deal with deep themes around human emotion and relationships I, you know i think the best spy novels that is that is the heart of them right um it, it's not uh, it's not necessarily that the trade craft or the stuff surrounding it it's the human relationships and then you have to balance that with the fact that the world of spy craft is becoming more impersonal like so much of you know our world um the communication the relationships they're more they're happening more online a lot of a lot of the uh the collection is enabled <laughs> you know without humans involved and so what do you do with that you know and, and so i'm trying to balance these two things i think in my stories where i want the heart of the book the heart of the story to be about the people and yet i'm trying to create a world that bears some resemblance some resemblance to reality you know there's some very similar to there's some authenticity because you know, if you, it, it, this is just, this is my opinion and authors in the genre, I think have taken different approaches to it. But if you completely ignore the tech, I think there's something about it that doesn't smell right, necessarily. And then if you go the other direction and kind of make the authenticity around the way the business actually works, the centerpiece, I think you can lose the human component. And so there's a, there's a tension there and a balance, I think, in any story and I'll say that in general, what I've tried to do, tried to make that balance work for me as a reader. But I, I, I am, when, when they're in conflict, I'm generally trying to promote or, uh, or advance the interests of the human relationships and spread a little bit of pixie yeah. dust over the other stuff to just get through it so that we can, we can make the dance between case officer in asset or between two CIA case officers themselves or between two rushes, you know, make that the centerpiece of that scene. But it's tough. You know, um, a lot of the conversations I'm having with, with, you know, former CIA officers as I'm doing these, you know, writing these books, like a lot of the conversations I'm having are about how the, how the tech works, you know, how, how does Covcom work today? How do you actually recruit somebody in a world of ubiquitous technical surveillance and the fact that there is just so much information available about everybody at all times, you know, that makes things like travel, you know, an alias travel at all. Um, the idea of you, you know, masquerading as somebody else, uh, all those things, um, just basic cover, all that stuff is so much harder now. So I think to tell these stories, you've got to, you know, you have to invest in kind of, if you want to tell them authentically, you got to invest a little bit in our research to kind of get some of that stuff right and then figure out where you spread the pixie dust on the tech so that you can focus on the human side of things. So you clearly use current research because you've been out for what, five years? Ten. I got out in 20, 2014. Ten. But you still have contacts and you still research what's current and how people operate. So the books have to be vetted, right? I mean, what happens with the vetting? The vetting, and do you have to take anything out? Because you would have signed whatever the American equivalent is of the Official Secrets Act, so you can't just bring out anything you want, right? That's right. That's right. So I um, there's a there's a CIA publication review board that reviews everything from like resumes to op eds to novels to you know if you're writing a memoir, and they 
they're they're actually you know which is surprising for a government body relatively efficient and effective at their jobs and they they read stuff quickly the the edits that they make have in my experience so far been fair and they're willing especially with fiction to be a bit more permissible than i think we all imagine and so everybody who reads this book everybody wants to know what's made up and whether the cia really thinks these things and so i'm going to give you a quick fire round of a few things what's real what's not real okay so number one do you think there really are cia characters as colorful and as dedicated and as hard as artemis Proctor? Yes, I do actually. I mean, I think I think not as consistently crazy as she is, you know, but many of the things that she has done in the novels actually happen. You know, so like yes, a- absolutely. And in fact, most of the things I'll say, most of the things that she's done in the novel happen. At some point she talks about how a normal organization would never hire her. You know, she couldn't work for a normal organization. And that is true. The CIA is not a normal organization. Things that would get you run out of any normal corporate are not necessarily fireable offenses inside CIA. I mean, so 100% true is the answer to that one. Okay, next one. Now, you had in there something which kind of scrambled my brain, which was the notion of, like, directed energy weapons that can be used to scramble the brains of opposing agents. Yes, is the answer. And it's essentially microwaves. Um, Like, harmful microwave radiation. And it was initially, like, for for many, many years during the Cold War, the the... Um, the KGB's second chief directorate, so the the internal folks, would they pumped like microwave radiation toward the U.S. embassy in the hopes of actually collecting. It, it was like it's like a SIGINT collection mechanism, and has been for a very long time. And I actually have friends who served in the embassy in Moscow. One of whom one one of these guys uh, believes that his hair went totally white when he was in Moscow because of all the microwave radiation. Um, but in its modern incarnation, this has led to, you know, I think what's been termed in the press as Havana syndrome. You know, this, this started in Cuba with these sort of traumatic brain injuries that, that diplomats and CIA officers have had when they've been exposed to high concentrated doses of microwave radiation. And there's a lot of stuff about this that is, like, if you, if you read stories about this, it's kind of confusing because there, there's been, formal inquiries done in the states that have sort of dismissed it but there's actually a small group of agency officers and diplomats who have really suffered serious brain injuries um and there's a lot of theories about what it is but it is true that if you have if you pump microwave energy you know at a room at somebody um it'll have you know extremely harmful effects on on their brain um so that's true Wow. Okay. I wish that one wasn't true. Okay. Number three at the quick fire round. I was reading the book over New Year and I happened to be staying in a house in the country with a load of lawyers and they all claim this bit isn't true. So I'm interested to know what you think. Is there in existence a load of shady law firms in London, possibly elsewhere, where lawyers are paid over the odds to help launder dodgy money? <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know about London. I mean, I feel like I feel like the answer should be yes in London. I mean, given what I've read about, you know, sort of the the laundromat for Russian money. But um, the law firm in the book is based loosely on the Panamanian law firm, Mossack Fonseca, which did not, I, I think, laundering. I, they were not the ones laundering the money, but they were the ones. And this is a Panamanian firm that essentially um created the the sort of financial and organizational and legal structures for celebrities politicians you know very wealthy you know business leaders all over the world to hide money now whether that money was legitimately earned or not i think the law firm basically said we don't care and they they worked like like putin most famously 
a uh i believe he's a i'm gonna get it wrong either a cellist or a violinist with the saint Pe- with a saint petersburg orchestra who's a friend of putin's who was like the beneficiary of a you know t- tens of millions of dollars of, of wealth that this firm had helped sort of organize and structure in like the british virgin islands or the caymans or something like that so it's a, that is a real thing um whether it's happening in sort of dodgy outfits in Mayfair, eh, you know, I I won't say, uh, not the least of which because you know Moscow X is is coming out here in in the UK in just in just a few days, and so I don't I don't want any trouble when I'm in London promoting it. <laughs> but uh, I I uh, I will say like the the idea of a firm like that existing very true. Where it is, I okay. I couldn't say. But it has existed in the very recent past. All right, next one. There's a character in your book, and do people like him exist? He's a shady billionaire hedge fund guy who helps out the CIA. All right, so uh, there are a lot of Americans um, who who have business concerns globally or net, global networks that are willing to help the CIA. That's 100% true. Now, his, the, the, the Harry Hamilton character in Moscow X is a very extreme version of this. Cause I did kind of need an all purpose billionaire who was able to make more things happen than I think most friends and, and supporters of the CIA would be able or willing to, yeah. you know? Um, so the, I think the scope here is extreme. So that's false, but I think that the, uh, the existence of, you know, well-placed and wealthy friends of the agency who don't work formally for the agency but want to help, that's very real. Okay, wow. So lots of this is stuck out to be true. I'm, I'm kind of pleased with that. Um, in both of your books, Damascus Station and Moscow X, there are exfiltrations, ex- like so people being smuggled out of hostile situations. I wondered how common they are. Are they kind of more in the stories or does that happen? Obviously, I know some of them have happened. So I can think of a few high-profile ones. And obviously we don't know about the ones that aren't high profile. But are people constantly kind of smuggled across borders in car trunks and suitcases? I don't think constantly. I think, I think again, this is one of these cases where the idea of an exfiltration, the idea of a very tense, tightly orchestrated exfiltration. I mean, you know, Gordievsky, right? It, it like is a yeah. great example of this where it's like, that's true. That happened. There was an immense amount of planning that went into it. There was an extremely tense set of circumstances that led up to it that that were fitting for a you know a, a spy novel. Um, so they happen. They happen less frequently, I think, than you would you would imagine. I think a lot of the exfiltrations that do occur are more mundane because someone might be able to travel or be able to reasonably cross a border, and so they just leave and then don't come back. You know, that would be more common. Um, but, but that's less, you know, that's less fun, uh, to write yeah. about. So I think, I think the answer here is less frequently than you see them in spy novels, less dramatic than in spy novels, but you know, you can, you can still point to some cases where, um, you know, like in, in Moscow X, they're, 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 the, the two knocks are, uh, or non-official cover officers are exfiltrated via, uh, dog sled right through, through Finland, which, which, you know, I'm not sure if it's happened, but I will say that a number of the former Russia House guys that I spoke to and who I had read portions of it said, that's not so far off. So, I, you know, I felt like I was getting, I felt like I was close enough and it was dramatic. So I, I went with it. So we'll say a mix, uh, you know, true and false on that one. Brilliant. I love that. And the, the shady Russia House friends viewers giving a wink. So one of the bits about both books that felt really really authentic to me was the wider geopolitical setting of both of them and I guess you know your background was as a international relations analyst so that makes sense you began Moscow X before the invasion of Ukraine is that right and so how much did you have to then kind of pivot in order to accommodate in order to accommodate that did it change the story or was it actually just feeding to a narrative that you were already working on it uh this was one of the more frustrating and painful aspects of writing this novel because I had just finished the first draft when it became clear in kind of that that 
late 21, early 22 period that like something was going to happen. And when it did, I sat down and, you know, I, I didn't have to like gut the thing, but I did have to make it feel like Russia was at war. You know, when I'm setting scenes inside Moscow and St. Petersburg, like I had to go through those again and say, gosh, how does this impact the feel here? You know, or does it? And and in some cases it did, and in some cases it didn't. But I felt like kind of the domestic rendering of Russia had to change a bit. And then the second thing that did have to change was, you know, I was I I had created a story prior to the invasion or the the second invasion, um, that you know I I sort of had a back and forth between the CIA and the Russians early in the novel to get the agency to a point where they would consider a covert action program like the one that's that that Proctor undertakes in Moscow X. And after the invasion, I kind of felt like I could get it made it cleaner in some respects because I was like, well, I need to situate Proctor's character with that crazy scene we talked about up front where she's, you know, victimized by the Russians. But from a geopolitical standpoint, I can kind of just get into it um, because the extent of Russian aggression and what was going on in Ukraine. So that made it cleaner, but it was still, I had to take a whole bunch of stuff out that I had, I had built into the story and kind of streamline things. So I think it ended up being helpful to the storytelling, but it did necessitate a lot of, a lot of work after, after February of 2022. Yeah. There was one of the characters, a, a Russian character, one of the villains, a guy called Chernoff. I'm sure there's a, <laughs> the best Russian way of saying that. Uh, but he's the kind of grunt who does all the dirty work for the big boss. But he has this particular, peculiar blend of spiritual Russian nationalism. Like, you know, we are the chosen people. And I wondered if he was a post-invasion invention because it felt like it resonated with a lot of stuff I'd been reading after the invasion of Ukraine about Putin's motivations and his kind of mystic Russian nationalism. And I'd wondered if you'd uh, put him in before or whether he'd been, you know, an existing uh, character. No, he he had actually been in before. Um, He was inspired, and I wouldn't recommend anyone actually do this because it's kind of mind-numbing, but I I read a lot of the work of Ivan Ilyin, who is a fascist, like a Russian fascist philosopher from the you know 19 teens 20s and and has been kind of who i think was forgotten for a long period of time here in 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 the west but has sort of been resurrected by putin and some of the people around him as like you know sort of for some of the sort of philosophical architecture for the regime and he is an interesting character because he blends this very weird it's it's a it's a weird mishmash of like fascism as we would have imagined it in like the 30s with a view with like russian a sort of messianic vision of russia and uh this kind of third rome stuff that that i think is is captivating to a lot of the people around putin and so I found that stuff to be really interesting and literally just like synthesize some of his thinking and put it in Chernov because oh. I felt like, you know, Chernov is a, there's a lot going on with him, but he, but he is the antagonist. Like he's a villain of the story, right? He's not a sympathetic character, even if he is interesting. And so I wanted to make him this sort of dark reflection, I think of, uh, of Russia, you know, of the side of Russia that I think many of us would find pretty disturbing. Uh, and so I just, in- I had injected that. And I think after the invasion, when I was reworking things, you know, it, it honestly felt like I could give that a little bit more room to breathe in the story too. Like it felt with, you know, Putin's letter about Ukraine and these kind of, Whoa. the way that they would speak about Russia's mission in the world, it, it felt like you know okay this didn't this doesn't feel like some weird side show this is the centerpiece of russian you know strategic thinking to some degree and so i could just let it let it go and run, and run with it so it was i think started before the invasion but it was sort of amplified afterward 
There's this relationship between the CIA and Putin is a really interesting one in the book. And Proctor does this absolutely brilliant speech. I'm actually going to read a little bit about it, where she says, If we do nothing, the Russians keep poking. They are barbarians without limits or morals. It's how they operate. In the past 10 years or so, we've all watched Putin poke and prod and generally fuck with the CIA and the United States with complete impunity. And then she kind of lists in this very colourful way all the terrible ways in which Putin has been poking and prodding. I thought that was absolutely brilliant. Is that a generally held view in the CIA, do you think? Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. And in fact, the line, her line about they are barbarians without limits or morals. One of the first calls I had with one of these guys, you know, because I early in the process, I'm just I'm asking pretty broad questions and trying to see who's going to talk and who's not. Gonna, and one of the guys was like, hey, you know, he had spent a lot of time in Moscow and he had worked on the Russian target his entire career. And he comes at this with with a, a deep respect for the Russian secret services. And he said they are barbarians without limits or morals. Like, and I'm like, you know, can I use that for the book? Because that's perfect. And he said, absolutely. And that view is, is the view on Russia, I think, um, that so many officers who have had so much experience in surface area with the Russians would hold is just respect and a view that, you know, they will just push and push and push and take whatever they can. And the only way that stops is if you make it painful for them. That like yeah. that's that's the view. Now, whether that's true or not, you know, I think maybe a little bit above my pay grade, but that is very much the view of, of the case officer cadre that I that I have interacted with. The response in the book is obviously to launch these kind of covert ops. And I was really interested in this because, you know, so I've been doing quite a lot of work recently on broader intelligence issues, and it seems to me that Intelligent history as a discipline takes what it does seriously, and rightly so, but more generalist historians often discount intelligence as, you know, kind of game playing. So it's a kind of side hustle. And this is just, you know, the Russian Secret Service pissing around with the American Secret Service. And actually, although sometimes, occasionally, it does have real world implications, most of the time it's just a game and maybe even a bit childish. Um, and do you think there's an element of that? Or do you think this stuff, you know, the messing around, especially through sp- cyberspace, I mean, you know, there's one thing landing a detachment of Marines in the Bay of Pigs, but it's another thing kind of pissing about with each other on cyberspace. Does that actually mean anything? It's a great question. Uh, and it's it's one that, you know, I think the, I, I don't think there's a good answer. I think I think sometimes it does. I think sometimes it does. And it would be, I think, stock and trade inside CIA to say that every officer inside the organization, and I actually think I included this line in the, in the book, you know, you kind of get one or a small handful of, of experiences, operations, recruitments where you'll say that really mattered. That mattered to U.S. national security and to the informational advantage that we need over our adversaries, you know? Um, I think a lot of it doesn't. And when you're in the midst of it, it can be very hard to sort what's impactful versus what's not, what's ephemeral. So, I, you know, and I do think to the point that I'm sure a lot of intelligence historians have raised, that once you create a large bureaucracy focused on spying, and set it to work against other large bureaucracies focused on spying, you are going to end up with a bit of a self-licking ice cream cone kind of vibe here where you have these organizations going at each other. What's the gain for national security, you know, for information advantages over our adversary from some of this stuff? It's probably pretty limited. And if we were to look at the ROI on some of these reports, from any kind of financial or economic standpoint, you'd be like, "Ooh, that was a bad investment," you know. Um, so I think I think all of that exists together, you know, at the same time. And I hope I hope that in the books there's some element, although of course they're 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 fiction, and so they are focused on, by definition, more impactful, interesting, glamorous operations, you know, that some of that pointlessness comes through too 
and like what is this all for because you know at the end of moscow x i mean you know i I don't i don't take a position on this which is kind of a funny thing to say because i wrote the thing but like i uh i think you could read the end of that story and say and come down on either side of this you could say totally worth it and you could also say not worth it you know And, and that ambiguity is what makes the story interesting to me um and i think it reflects something that is real inside the espionage business so you said book three is nearly done can you tell us anything about it where it's set or anything or is it you know top secret no it's not it's not it's not top secret it's been cleared by the cia's publication review boards as not top secret so i can share it um the book is titled the seventh floor it is a mole hunt a modern mole hunt so it it has some elements of an homage to tinker taylor soldier spy but it is set present day uh there is a russian uh mole operating at the highest reaches of langley who is it that's the story and uh artemis proctor is back in the george smiley chief mole hunter role uh sam joseph from damascus station is back uh helping proctor and uh the book will be out in the u.s in October this year and TBD on the UK, but probably sometime between October and January of next year. So coming soon. It's in it is actually done. Like I'm editing it, putting the final touches, but it's that uh it, it is it is pretty much complete. Artemis Proctor is back. Oh my goodness, I cannot tell you how happy that makes me. More unhinged than than ever. Awesome, awesome. I will look forward to that. So on that note, David, I would just like to uh, say thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. And I hope it encourages anybody who hasn't read Damascus Station or Moscow X to pick them up immediately, which I strongly encourage. Um, So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful um, and a real treat. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to give us a follow. We're dropping once every two weeks. And the next episode is the brilliant Helen Fry talking about Edith Cavell, nurse, spy, heroine. Don't miss it.